Okay, today is uh, 24 May 2001. We're at the uh, Jamaica National Guard Armory in Jamaica, New York. We're interviewing Mr. Uh, Lawrence Goldstein. And uh, my name is Wayne Clark. I'll be doing the interviewing. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, tell me when, you, when and where you were born. I was born uh, February the 10th, 1922 in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, and uh, tell me a little bit about your family. Uh, what, what did your parents do? Well, uh, I was the uh, youngest of four children, and my father was a um, plumbing and heating contractor, and um, we had a very good family life. My father was a very good uh, provider, uh, did very well in business. Okay, uh, any brothers or sisters? Yes, I had um, a brother nine years older than me, another brother about sister about um, 14 years older than I. Uh -huh. And uh, whereabouts did you go to school? I went to uh, school in uh, public school in uh, Brooklyn, and then I graduated from Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. And uh, about what year was that? That was uh, 1940. OK. And uh, do you recall what you were doing when uh, Pearl Harbor yes, happened? Yes, I know exactly what I was doing. I was laying on my bed, listening to the giant Dodgers play football at the Polo Grounds in New York. Uh huh. And then the announcement came, of course, that was the Pearl Harbor bombing. Oh. As it's been said by many people, no one uh, knew where Pearl Harbor was or what it was. And uh, it, at that point, uh, did you decide to uh, go go down and enlist, or, uh, or what happened? As a matter of fact, I did. My my brother, who was older than I, nine years old. Drafted um, right after Pearl Harbor, and um, I was gung ho as, as every young man was in America, and I went down to enlist in the Marines at Whitehall Street in New York City. Uh -huh. And um, the old Marine sergeant asked me what my draft number was, my lottery number. When I told him, he said, "Go home. I think you'll be called up in a couple of weeks." And he was right. Okay, and. Uh where did you go for training? Your well, uh, we uh, were immediately sent to uh, Miami Beach for basic training. And there we had the screening and the testing and so forth. Uh-huh. And uh, what was the training like? Was it, was it tough? Uh, well, we didn't know what to expect from day to day. And of course, we had the Miami uh, muggy heat, which um, was very difficult in the newly um, starched uniforms that we were wearing. Um, and we couldn't wait to get out of there. And uh, once you completed your uh, basic training, where did you go from there? Well, I was classified to be a radio operator mechanic. And I was sent to Chicago, Illinois, where the Army Air Corps had taken over several large hotels in downtown Chicago as the radio schools and barracks. Uh-huh. And, and what was that training like? That was, uh, well, that was, that was very intensive. The only trouble was that um, this was so early in the war, and we had rushed into things, our country. And uh, as a result, we didn't have qualified military instructors. And so the Army Air Corps, which was what we were part of, hired civilians from the uh, industry. Uh, to teach us the Morse code, we had Western Union telegraphers and um, um, radio mechanics were taught by uh, people who worked in the radio uh, mechanic industry. Okay, and once you completed that part that, of your training? That course was uh, from um, <coughs> November of 42 uh, to um, March of 44. And then I was classified to go to a radar school at Boca Raton, Florida, with several other men. And when we got down there, um, we were three guys from New York, and we were 20 years old, and we decided that a radar operator future in the military was not for us. And they had a, a um, provision there that every Friday you took a course, uh, you took a test on the, on the week's work. If you flunked the course, you were out of there. And we decided that after one week, that was enough for us. And so we flunked out. 
and on the following Wednesday or Thursday we were shipped out. And we proceeded to, at that time, the Army Air Corps had taken over Salt Lake City Air Base um, as a replacement center. And uh, everybody who had gone to a technical school was sent there to be reclassified and re, uh, re, uh, sent out to another base. And uh, we volunteered for uh, aerial gunnery school because we heard the incentives. And for 20 year old it impressed us. Uh -huh. And those incentives were, if you uh, graduated aerial gunnery school, you received a pair of silver wings on your chest. You received 50% increase in pay, flight pay, and promotions would come with graphic that was enough for us. Okay, and uh, tell me a little bit about the aerial gunnery training. What, what was well, that like? Normally aerial gunnery training, you would be sent to an air base and you would um, fly in um, uh, the rear seat of an, what they called an AT-6 advanced trainer with a pilot firing. But we didn't go to that kind of a school. We went to the only aerial gunnery school in the Army Air Corps that didn't have flying. And it was a rush, rush job because when we were classified for the school, they called out and asked any radio operators who were in this group want to go to gunnery school, fall out, which we did. And little be known to us at the time that was the beginning of the building of the bomber crews uh, as the planes were coming out of the factories. And so we were rushed through school. We went to school at Wendover, Utah. Uh -huh. uh, which we call the end of the world. We were there in a school that was set up in old CC barracks, uh, 100 degree temperature, with very little running water. Uh, we had to have water trucked in. Showers, uh, we took three or four showers a day because of the heat. And uh, we suffered through for six weeks, and finally we graduated. And uh, to be impressed by getting a pair of silver wings on your chest was my epitome at that time. Uh huh. Now, uh, once you graduated, then what, what happened? Uh, they sent us to, um, uh, we ended up at an air base in uh, the state of Washington called Moses Lake Army Air Base, which was a brand new base, so new that the barracks were already finished. So for the first couple of weeks, we lived in tents and we flew almost every day, and if we weren't flying, we were going to a ground school class. We became a crew, we met our crew, and um, at that age, this was, this was in um, about, uh, oh, I guess September of 1943, mm -hmm. and none of us, except the pilots, had ever seen a plane before, a bomber, and when we saw a B-17, it was our first, we were very much impressed, uh -huh. I was. And um, on my very first flight, I sat in the radio room and somewhat overwhelmed by being in an airplane, um, being a radio operator, and being a part of a 10-man crew. Uh, our pilot was um, a good man, and he showed that he was a leader right away. And um, the first thing he insisted on for the other nine people uh, uh, in his statement, I can remember it. I'm not interested in your personal life. All I want to know is that you know your job and someday in a combat situation, you may save the life of the other nine men. And that was to come true later on in our combat experience. Mm -hmm. So we trained for about three months, which was called phase training. And then when we were suddenly uh, overnight told, well, the training is over, and we went at that time to Salina, Kansas from, from uh, Washington. Uh, we were then at Spokane, Washington. We went by train to Salina, Kansas where they had a, what they called a staging area. And there you were brought up to date on everything. Uh, new uniforms, new flying equipment, everything. And uh, we stayed there for a couple of days and then we, we shipped out to um, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey which was the point of embark embarkation for overseas. Uh-huh, did you uh, get to go home at all? No, uh, well I did get home two nights from, from um, uh, Camp Kilmer. Uh, they gave us passes, but we had to be back at seven o'clock in the morning. So we left at five and we only had a few hours and, and 
and it was roughly a three hour train trip to get home. So six hours of that was taken up by train, uh, but just to get home and see the family uh, was uh, encouraging. Uh -huh. And uh, suddenly they sealed off the telephones and we realized that we were getting ready to ship out overseas. And uh, we sailed on the Queen Mary uh, with 15,000 other men. And when we boarded the ship at about 11 o'clock at night, by the time we bedded down, we were out on the open seas. The ship had moved out. And uh, at that point in the war, the Queen Mary was big enough to, to cross the ocean without a convoy. And every three minutes, it would zigzag taking a meandering course. Uh -huh. And the reason for that was a submarine, a German submarine, needed uh, some time to line up for a shot. And uh, the rumors were rampant that the Germans wanted to sink a, the Queen Mary with 15,000 troops on board. Five days later, we got into the Firth of Forth, which is uh, Scotland, and there we um, disembarked from the ship. We were the last group of people on, uh, and we were the first off because they took us off from the top down. And we went to a replacement camp in England, I can't remember where that was, and um, they told us we'd be there about 10 days and two weeks. We were there five days when they rushed us up to a bomb room. Um, scary, because we didn't know what we were going into. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got into the, uh, we were 30 replacement bomber crews, that was 300 men. And not all of us went to the same group, but the ones that I was with, we ended up at the 388th bomb group, which was at a place called Nettishaw in England. And we got there at 8.30 at night, and we got into a barracks, and the enlisted men lived uh, separate from the officers. There were six men in the barracks, and the barracks actually took uh, five other uh, six men through. All those beds were empty. and. When one of our group said, well, where were these guys? He said, oh, they were all shot down in the last few days. Well, as 21-year-olds, we were very impressed. Uh -huh. <laughs> and someone said, and we volunteered for this, you know. Um, and what had happened in history, now I'm a bit of a historian, in history, that was the result of the famous Stuttgart raid in which the 8th Air Force lost about 80 crews. And also, just before that, the famous Schweinfurt Raid, which uh, cost 60 crews, that's 600 men, in one shot. Mm -hmm. So 60 and in excess of 40, um, the losses were so heavy to the 8th Air Force that they had a stand down. That's no missions for about 10 days to two weeks until they regrouped. Uh, and I was part of that regrouping with my crew. Uh, we flew some training missions, and then on November the 26th of 43, we flew our first combat mission. And that began the tour. Um, at the time, they told us if you flew 25 combat missions, you would get to return to the States. If you flew eight, it was a miracle. If you flew 10, somebody up there liked you. To do 25 was almost impossible. And we as a crew did it in 99 days. Um, as a part of a Air Force history of the 8th Air Force, that period was called the heaviest loss to the 8th Air Force of any period of the war, uh, which went on from 42 to 45. Included in our tour was the missions of Big Week, which were four raids uh, against the German aircraft industry. My crew flew all four of those, including two of them, which were the longest raids of the war, 11 and a half hours in the air. Um, we survived uh, 23. And when it came to 24, we went for a briefing on March the 30th, 1944. And we were hoping for a very, very light bomb run. It turned out that Berlin had never been bombed that day in the daytime by the 8th Air Force. And they decided on March the 3rd to make the first raid. When we heard it, we were very depressed mentally because we had very little feeling of whether we would be able to survive it. 
we went to the briefing, we went to our airplane, and we did everything that we had to do to prepare for the mission. The 8th Air Force flew that day well into Germany. We had much enemy aircraft and flak uh, fire. And suddenly we were recalled. The whole 8th Air Force re was recalled. Whether the weather was bad at the target and they didn't want to risk the force um, that deep into Germany, we never knew. But we were recalled. And when we were going to dinner at night, we found out we were credited with the mission. And so we said 24, it can't be as bad as that for the last one. And lo and behold, on March the 4th, we went again to the briefing, and it was as if it was a repeat, because the, the commanding officer stood there and said, well, everything I gave you yesterday goes for today, too. And today we're going to go all the way. Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, got into the air and um, we were sweating it out, waiting for a recall. And as a radio operator, I would probably get the first uh, notice on our radio. And as we kept flying, they kept calling me, and my nickname on the airplane was Goldie. And they kept calling in, Goldie, had, did you hear anything? Did you hear anything? And this was getting a little nerve wracking until our co pilot said, let him alone. When he hears it, we'll all know. And when we were about 40 minutes from Berlin, we were well over enemy territory and had received a lot of anti-aircraft fire. Um, there was the report that we were waiting to hear, and that was abandoned operations returned to the base. And the whole 8th Air Force group, which was about 800 bombers at the time, made a turn for home. Um, and as we were taking a heading towards home, our bombardier, who was a 20-year-old cowboy from Montana, said, um, we don't want to take these bombs back on our last mission. Let's drop them. And you could drop them on any target of opportunity, it was called, something that had a military objective to it. And um, we, we took a quick vote over the intercom radio, and we said, let's do it. And what it meant was dropping out of the formation and the protection of the other aircraft and pulling a 360-degree turn, picking out a target. And he saw, uh, from about 20,000 feet, he saw a railroad yard with um, um, railroad cars. And he said, let's make a run on that. We made a quick bomb run. We dropped the bombs, and um, the tail gunner said, um, it looks like you, you did a good job because they kind of struck across the, the rail yard. And then our airplane went into a climbing position to get back into the formation, which was now miles ahead of us. And as we were climbing back, there was an explosion. And in reviewing the history of the event, uh, it turns out that there was a, a Fock Wolf 190 who had saw us down as a lone aircraft, and that was almost a kill for him. And so he put a couple of 20 millimeter shots at us, and we didn't realize whether we were hit or not. And we went into the clouds, and when we came out, uh, leveled out in the clouds, we took a head count. And everybody checked in uh, from the tail position on. Everybody was okay, and there was no apparent damage to the aircraft. But every time we come out of the clouds, the German would shoot 20 millimeter puffs would, would be uh, coming out. And the pilot said to the navigator, Phil, get us a heading. And he had been away from his navigation uh, equipment. He was manning a, a machine gun. And then the pilot said to me, Goldie, get us a radio fix. Well, the British had a setup because they had been doing this since 1939. And they knew if you went on this particular frequency, you were in trouble. And they had three stations would plot a fix on you, and one station would, would break you, your, your sending of your message and tell you where you were, and they would tell it in the clear your position is. And then if you took it down, I could give it to the navigator. The first time they sent it, it was jammed by the Germans. They had a musical note which jammed it. Um, the second time, it was jammed, but on the third frequency, they couldn't jam. And 
with a little difficulty, I got the message and they kept repeating it and repeating it so that I could make sure that what I had copied in Morse code. Um, I gave it to the navigator when he plotted a course we came out over the English Channel. And when we saw the white cliffs of Dover, we figured we had it made, um, which was always a welcome sight. We got back to our base area and um, when we approached our field, the other planes of our formation, of our group, had already landed, and they saw us going into the clouds. They had reported one aircraft going down, which was us. Um, we landed, and as we hit the runway, we had no brakes. Our hydraulic system had been shot out. And so we went off the end of the runway. We did a slow ground loop in a farm field, which was surrounding the air, air base. And the crash trucks and the ambulances all came out. How many, anybody hurt, you know, and we were all out of the aircraft, the 10 of us. I said, no, no one's hurt. And I said, well, look at the hole in the radio room. And I had flown for about three hours with this hole above my head, about eight inches in diameter, with the air hitting me at 50 below zero, not seeing it, and, not one, and wondering why my oxygen mask was freezing up. And it would freeze up, and you'd have to take it off and break the ice and put it back on. Um, so. We got a little weak need when we saw it. Now, the next day, March the 5th, was no mission for the 8th Air Force. Everything was grounded. Now, what, what year was this? This was 1944, March 44. March 4th, 44. March 5th to 44, there was no raid. We went down to the line, the flight line, to see the airplane, and they were working on it, and it was just completely um, shrapnel damage. Um, we got the engineering report. And the engineering officer had found there was one 20 millimeter hole in the radio room, one 20 millimeter hole in the bomb bay, one 20 millimeter hole in the waste position. And his report was um, numerous shrapnel damage to the upper wing surface. Well, we walked away from that airplane with the credit for our 25th mission. The next day was March the 6th of 1944. The Eighth Air Force went to Berlin and they lost 69 bombers which was the single heaviest loss of the whole 8th Air Force of World War II. But we were in our beds, we pulled that cover over our heads and went back to sleep. Um, and that was my combat tour. Now let me ask you, uh, what was the name of your ship? Well, we called the airplane Worry Water, although we never got it onto the airplane because the first airplane we had after seven missions was taken away from us. and. Um, as a historian, I have done some research with an English friend of mine. And of the 25 missions, we flew, um, I think it was 14 different aircraft. Of the 14 aircraft, 10 of those aircrafts were shot down or destroyed after we walked away from them. Mm -hmm. So somebody up there like this. Um, ordinarily, you would get to go home to train other combat crews. I got um, sidetracked. Eight radio operators were taken and put aside to become instructors with new groups, and I was one of those. And we were promised to go home if we, if the group flew their first combat mission. And lo and behold, the eighth, the eighth Air Force came through on their promise. And um, three days after D-Day, June the ninth, I sailed for the states with about uh, 900 other guys on a ship. And we were glad to get out of there because the, the rumor was going around that if D-Day came, everybody would have to go back and fly another tour. Mm -hmm. And we were glad to get out of there. Uh, we didn't realize at the time that the losses were that heavy and that they were training people in the States that had to be get overseas to fill the losses. And so they needed pilots, bombardiers, navigators, radio men, engineers to train other people. So when we returned home, uh, they gave us a rest and recuperation leave of about 21 days. Um, I got married, and I took my wife back with me. Uh, we went to Galveston, Texas, which was an instructor school for about a month, and then I was assigned to the B-29 program in Clovis, New Mexico. And for one whole year, I flew as a radio instructor on B-29s with uh, almost 500 hours of uh, flight time. 
the war ended and I was discharged. How was uh, uh, the B-29 comparison to the Well, the first time I walked down to the flight line and I saw a B-29, I remember I had I kept a diary and I had made this entry in the diary for the three years I was in the service I entered every day and I walked from the tail of the aircraft underneath it to the nose and I said it's too big it'll never get off the ground as compared to a B-17. It turned out to be a very fine airplane except that the early models that we were flying had a great amount of trouble and the training missions that we were flying with our crews was supposed to be seven hours. We hardly ever got seven hours because there was always some mechanical f difficulty and we would land there for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, five hours. Uh, over the years time, I don't know how many seven hour flights we actually made. Um, there was engine problems with those early models. As I read later on, that they were having a difficulty. Uh, there were a lot of close calls but thank God I was not involved in any mishap. Mm -hmm. Now, did you mainly uh, fly with the same pilots? And yeah, we flew as instructor crews, uh -huh. and the, my instructor crew was a lieutenant colonel who had flown 50 missions in the 8th Air Force. And we had a pilot instructor, a navigation instructor, an engineer instructor, radio instructor as myself. And on one training flight, the pilots have to get a certain amount of landings and takeoffs. And when we made a landing, um, this aircraft had a tricycle landing gear. So it would set down on the main gear, and then when it lost its speed, it would set down on the nose gear. And we had a tremendous amount of vibration. And so the instructor pilot told the pilot to pull into the line. They checked out something. We never got off the airplane. We went around, flew again, landed again, a very bad vibration so we pulled into the line and we offloaded everybody and for about an hour and a half we were on the flight line they changed something they replaced something who knows we took off again and this wasn't just getting into an airplane and sitting down and strapping in and like you do on a, on a airliner today it was a big big operation we took off, we flew around, we landed again, and the same vibration. And so the instructor pilot said over the radio, we're going to redline this airplane, which meant we were taking it out of, out of circulation. And in those days, in the heat of the New Mexico uh, summer, we were wearing light flight clothes, and we wore baseball caps, and they didn't have insignia. But we also had the flight caps, the overseas flight cap. And the colonel had his in his belt with his silver leaf inside. And as soon as we unloaded our equipment, the engineering jeep came out with a second lieutenant. And I made a, record, a record of this in my diary. And he jumped out of the jeep with his perennial clipboard and said, who's the pilot? He said, I am. What are you doing on the ground? This airplane only has about three hours and your colonel is going to be teed off. You don't have the seven hours. He said, I'm redlining the airplane. And the engineering officer said, the colonel's not going to like it. You better get your butt back in that airplane. And with that, the colonel took off his baseball cap, put on his silver leaf, and the second lieutenant said, yes, sir, if you say so, sir. And he took off. And he turned to me, and he, I was standing behind him, and he said to me, Goldie, I flew 50 missions and survived, and you flew 25. He said, if you think I'm going to get killed in this son of a gun, never. So I said, I'll fly with you any time. And for the year's time, we did all of our training together, and he was a good, good guy to be with. Uh, and that was my flying career. Now, what was your off time like? Uh, well, uh, very little to do in Clovis, New Mexico. Um, it was a B-29 training base, and my wife was from New York, and she had never been farther than Brooklyn, if you will. And being alone, you know, sometimes in the daytime, there was, was uh, very little to do. Uh, she tried to get a job on the base, but there wasn't anything available. And then just as the war was ending, uh, when before the Japanese um, surrendered, I uh, found out that she was pregnant. And so I wanted to send her home. And uh, they said to me, well, you're entitled to a leave. Why don't you take her home? So I took her from New Mexico back to New York and then went back 
um, to New Mexico uh, to sit out the war. And it was a case of who was going to get out when, depending on how many points you had accumulated. And I didn't have that many because my combat tour was very fast. Um, I did have points because of medals were awarded. Uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross, which drew quite a few points. Um, but months overseas were important, and I didn't have them. I was only there four months. Now, now going back to your, your tour in Europe, uh, you, you were talking about that last mission where uh, you were taking the flags from the, the German uh, fighter. Uh, prior to that, did you uh, get shot up at all? Or well... We had, we had quite a bit of uh, enemy action um, in those days. Um, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was very strong. And um, sometimes we wondered how these guys had the guts to fly to a formation of B-17s or B-24s with all those 50 caliber guns firing at them at the same time. But they did, and they shot down quite a few airplanes. And I had said one day, to a group of college kids, when we saw an airplane go down, we, we watched to see how many parachutes got out. And for a moment, we worried about who, the, who they were. And then we forgot about it because we were worried about ourselves. But when we came back to the base at night and we went into a barracks and saw six empty beds, and we realized that maybe those, were the, those guys, were they dead? Were they POWs? You know, we did not know, and we never did get information as to what they, what happened to them. That had to be very upsetting. It was. It was. We were, we were 20 years old, 21 years old. Our pilot was 24, and unfortunately, one of our guys got sick, uh, got hurt in a mishap. It was purely an accident, but uh, he was replaced, and the guy who was uh, replaced him was about 33 at that time, which was considered a very, very old man, mm -hmm. but he was a very capable guy and to this day is living in a nursing home in upstate New York. Uh, his name was Ed Kozacek, and his son presently lives in Del Mar, uh, New York, right outside Albany. And uh, I'm in touch with him, and he still survived. He's about 88 now. Um, and uh, of course, he has um, Alzheimer's, and he does remember his World War II activity, but nothing else. Amazing. Now, uh Uh, no, not, uh, there didn't seem to be any evidence of that because they needed people to train people and we were doing that. And um, we had one incident where my wife, <laughs> uh, she had the base operations phone number and we had, this is one of those small towns in New Mexico with a very low watt radio station and um, she was tuned in there one day and when I left at 3.30 in the morning, I said, I'll probably be flying today. Um, and if I did, I was home by noontime or one o'clock, the latest. And she heard on the radio, one of the B-29s from Clovis Air Base had crashed, but we're not sure at casualties. And so she had called the base to find out. And when she got somebody on the phone, she said, uh, my husband is, was Tech Sergeant Lawrence Goldstein and he was a radio instructor, and I know he's flying today. Was he on that crew? And the man she was talking to, a sergeant or whatever, said, um, what was his name? Uh, let me look it up. And it was like a minute became an hour, you know, and here's this 21-year-old new bride, uh, and he come back to the phone. He said, what did you say your husband's name was? And she said, Goldstein, Goldstein. He said, uh, Goldstein. No, no, he wasn't on that plane. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was something when I came home that afternoon I didn't know anything about this until I came home and she told me what the story was and um, you know you, it was, these were the kind of things that you endured as a young couple you know, and, and we were close uh, at that time um, and as I say I flew almost, not every day but I knew that I would be flying until the aircraft was grounded for some reason and then we were free to, you know, so we had some time in town, but there was very little to do. 
the USO was the biggest thing, and the Red Cross had a very uh, active uh, chapter, and an exciting night of activity would be playing bingo <laughs> in the, in the uh, USO. So uh, that was our life down there, and it was, it was exactly a year that I was there, and she spent about nine months there, and then the last three months she was home. Uh, yes, there were. There was, there was um, um, veterans who had flown, and they had been coming back. And um, as a matter of fact, when, when I had to leave, um, and I had met my sister in New York for lunch, and we went into a, the famous Schraff's restaurant. I'll never forget this. At that point in the war, very few veterans were returning from overseas, particularly from Europe. And I went in, and I had asked for another pat of butter. And this waitress said to me, Sergeant, don't you realize there's a war on? And I said, lady, what do you think these are? My ribbons and my, my decorations. And she was embarrassed and she brought me another pat of butter, my moment of triumph. Uh, now, uh, what was it like the day uh, Japan surrendered? Well, everything was um, kind of low key. Um, they said to us, go home, if you live off the base, um, uh, go, home, go home and stay home. Uh, if you are quartered on the base, um, the passes will be lifted and you couldn't go into town. They didn't want anybody, uh, I guess, taking off or whatever. It was a very low-key feeling. Uh, as a matter of fact, the day the A-bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, um, I was flying and I had it recorded in my diary. When I came home in the afternoon, my wife said, the radio station said they dropped some kind of a bomb in Japan and the war may be over. And I said, I'll find out tomorrow when I go into to the base. And I did, and never, nobody knew anything about it, and there was no discussion. We were kept in the, in the dark about these things. No, well, rumors were rampant, but... Uh, but I mean, prior to that, about... No, 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 we knew nothing about it. And, we, and bear in mind, we were training B-29 crews, which were weather crews. They were going to be going, after their training, into the Pacific to fly. Um, but there was no, if the command knew it, they didn't let, it, let the um, lower people know it. The um, officers and enlisted men did not know it. And there was no rumors going around. And then, the day they surrendered, I was also flying. And when I came home that afternoon, my wife said, the war's over, the war's over. You don't have to fly anymore. And I said, well, I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> and when I went in, um, the command put out a directive that all flying training will continue as scheduled, you know. And um, I went in, and I had found out my wife was pregnant with my uh, first son, first child, and I went in to um, ground myself, um, so to speak. And my colonel said to me, um, you have to fly. It's part of your duty, otherwise I'm going to have to break you. And I was kind of shattered. The next day I came into work, um, he said to me, get lost in the radio room. And so until I was discharged, all I did was hand out the headsets and the microphones that we used to the crews that were flying. And there was no repercussions. I don't know of anything more other than the fact that I was recalled to service in a Korean war. But. Yeah, definitely. We'd like to, like to get that information. Okay. Um, well, I was discharged in uh, October 1945 after exactly three years, almost to the day, the day I was drafted. And um, I was married. My wife had had the baby, my first son, Richard. And um, in New York City, they had a program uh, for returning veterans. Um, and. Um, it was a stepped-up course at, at City, City College of New York. And um, we were taught by, and the instructors were um, people who in, were in the field. 
There was a small business course for people who wanted to go into business. Uh, there was a selling course, which was something I wanted. And I was the only married veteran in the, in the program. And so the newspapers played it up and came to our house to take pictures of my wife and my son and I. And um, it was splattered all over the New York World Telegram and Sun at the time. Um, just prior to that, I had had a civil service job before I went into the service in 1942. And I was offered the same job, but it had been transferred to Washington, D.C. And at the time, I didn't want to go. So the Civil Service Commission said to me, well, as a veteran, you're entitled to a possible another job. And I filed a paper, a form, to become an air traffic controller. And without ever being interviewed or anything like that, I was accepted. And at the time, the program meant going out of, out of the state. And I got a telegram saying, report Monday such and such a date to Bangor, ba Maine, for training in this program. And they said, if you ever open up, if they ever open up an opportunity in New York area, you would be brought back to LaGuardia Airport. Well, uh, I was ready to go. My wife just didn't want to go with a baby, and so I turned it down. And um, I went into the selling field. Um, I went into the life insurance business, actually, and worked in it for some time. Uh, in 1949, I enlisted in the active Air Force Reserve at Floyd Bennett Naval Air Station in Brooklyn and flew uh, in, in there. They had C-47s, which was um, a troop, troop carrier outfit, and we flew uh, weekend warriors one week in the month. And in May of 1951, they activated our unit and sent us all to McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. Uh, that was May 1, 51. And um, I had been classified because of my past experience as an instructor, as a communication supervisor, and said I would be grounded, no flying duty, which was okay with me. Um, we were under the impression that reservists were called up to relieve active duty Air Force people so that they could go overseas. However, I ended up going to Japan for 14 months, and I had a ground job as a communication supervisor. It was a very responsible job at the time, but I was very lonely because my wife and two children now were at home. Um, the original activation was for 21 months or at the discretion of the service. Reservists who had been called up to duty and who had stayed in the United States were sent back or relieved of their duty in about a year. I was in Japan for 14 months, so out of the 21 months, I served about 18. Um, in October of 1952, uh, they released the all reservists, and I was sent back to the States. Um, I ended up at Mitchell Air Force Base uh, in uh, Long Island for my discharge, and they did a heck of a pressure job to get me to re-enlist, uh -huh. even into the reserves. That and I, I was a tech sergeant. Uh -huh. uh, and I didn't re uh, enlist for the simple reason that I had been doing the job of a master sergeant and was told by the classification officer that as soon as I got to my permanent base, I would be promoted. The colonel I worked for was a good guy, and he tried to get me promoted. But after the third... Uh, interview with the promotion board, they told me flat out that I was a reservist and they didn't want to race, uh, waste the rank of master sergeant on a reservist, even though I was doing his job. Uh, and so that kind of turned me off. And um, as things went on later on, I was kind of sorry that I didn't stay in the reserves because I would have retired with possibly a commission or at least a master sergeant's uh, income, uh, which would have helped. Um, but I didn't, and um, I had a successful career in the insurance business. In uh, 1975, the Eighth Air Force Historical Society was organized by a retired Air Force colonel,
who unfortunately is deceased now, and he was um, Walno, uh, Colonel Walno. And um, his idea was to perpetuate the history and heritage of the 8th Air Force and to honor the guys that we lost as prisoners of war or as killed in action. And um, I became active with this organization and was, from, was elected to their National Board of Directors. Uh, I have just completed a four-year term and in our national convention in October in Dallas, Texas, I'll be running for a fourth term and hope to be reelected, uh, second term, I should say, for another four years to be reelected. Um, I enjoy it because we are doing great things. Uh, we have created a museum in Savannah, Georgia, which is a world-class museum. And with the help of Governor Pataki, we have created a museum here at Farmingdale, New York, at the old Republic Aircraft Factory called the American Air Power Museum. And many of our 8th Air Force veterans of Long Island have donated their time, their services, and some of their memorabilia and artifacts that they have to this museum. I believe that's my story. Okay. Uh, is there anything we missed? Anything you'd like to touch on? Um, other than the fact that I'm working at restoring history for some families, um, with trying to get information from the military archives in uh, Maryland, which is open to the public. Um, the information is there. You just have to know how to get it. And um, mostly it deals with missing air crews that were shot down. Uh, either the uh, individual was uh, killed in action, missing in action, evaded, interned, or was a prisoner of war. And it's all there if you know where to find it. And I have been helpful to every family successfully that has uh, said to me, can you find some information about my father, about my brother? Uh, and it is particularly satisfying to be able to give a family some closure uh, to their family history. Um, and it even went down to my own daughter-in-law whose mother I know, but never knew the maiden name, and traced the fact that her uncle, who she never knew, was a navigator that was killed in a plane crash uh, with the 8th. Um, so those are the kind of things that I've spent my time doing. And every day I leave the house, my wife said, well, where are you going and who are you helping today? And um, I find a great satisfaction to be able to do that. You're certainly welcome.